you today. I, oh, it's my pleasure to talk to you today. I need to give you the caveat that I am not trained at all in any OBGYN. And so anything that I tell you about that topic will be something that I've read. So syndrome similar to POTS are first described in 1871 by a doctor, Da Costa. And he, he noticed that certain soldiers developed orthostatic intolerance after being exposed to war came to be known as irritable heart syndrome or DaCosta syndrome or soldier's heart. And when I read this, I found it very interesting because we'll learn later that POTS is much more common in patients who have post-traumatic stress disorder. But POTS itself wasn't described until 1993 by two physicians from the Mayo Clinic. Like Jillian said, it's likely more common since COVID and the Prevalence is likely somewhere around 1% of the population, and that's pre-COVID. 90% female predominance and usually presents during the childbearing age. So POTS, or orthostatic intolerance, is part of symptom complex of dysautonomia, or dys as in dysfunction, and autonomia of the autonomic nervous system. So all the parts of the brain that usually control things automatically. And so symptoms can be pretty vast. It includes not only orthostatic intolerance, but urinary symptoms, cardiovascular symptoms with palpitations and chest pain. Patients will often feel short of breath and easily winded despite having normal oxygenation. They'll often describe brain fog, problems with temperature regulation, and lots of GI symptoms. The symptoms of dysautonomia are not always present, which makes it difficult to diagnose. They can be unpredictable. But one thing that tends to be quite common is that you can actually graph the symptoms and they follow a woman's cycle. So POTS is a disease of gravity. And I'm not sure why they call it POTS as opposed to PTS because postural and orthostatic mean basically the same thing. So what happens is when you go from lying or sitting to standing, your blood volume isn't redistributed properly and so you don't get enough blood to your brain. And that causes dizziness and increase in heart rate. And, uh, and up to 30% of patients actually faint. So what happens is you get pooling in the lower body. Patients, uh, the heart tries to compensate. And so when the heart beats faster, there's less time for diastolic filling. So what happens is that the heart becomes less effective at pumping blood. And so in an attempt to compensate, it actually makes things worse. So a big part of treatment and controlling symptoms is actually reducing the heart rate. The quick and dirty criteria for diagnosing POTS is that if patients get out of bed first thing in the morning and they measure their heart rate, they'll notice an increase in 30 beats per minute within 10 minutes. There's different what are called subtypes of POTS, but in clinical practice, we really don't separate most of these out. And I think of these more as mechanisms because most patients have more than one subtype mixed into their, their clinical presentation. So there's neuropathic with autonomic neuropathy. There's hyperadrenergic. And hyperadrenergic POTS are patients who, rather than maintain their blood pressure, they actually have a, a rise in blood pressure by at least 10 points. And some of these patients have acute hypertensive crises with blood pressures as high as 240 over 140. So the reason that this subgroup is particularly important is because one of the mainstays of treatment for POTS is salt. And obviously treatment with salt in the hyperadrenergic subgroup is contraindicated. The vast majority of patients have decreased blood volume, partly why salt repletion works. Deconditioning can contribute. And 
POTS and other similar conditions often have small fiber neuropathy. And small fiber neuropathy is often missed because it doesn't show up with nerve conduction studies. So like we said, a lot more women than men, worse in the morning, but there's a whole bunch of associated symptoms. And depending on what you read, some groups will say that these are the symptoms of POTS themselves. I'm not convinced. I think POTS is commonly associated with other conditions. And so that the fatigue, brain fog, sleep disturbance, gut problems, headaches, or other pain are often the result of associated conditions rather than POTS itself. POTS is part of a family of conditions called central sensitivity syndromes. And you'll notice that I put an underline under the S because there's no such thing as central sensitivity syndrome as a separate syndrome. It's just a family name for conditions that cluster together. The common ones are chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS, fibromyalgia. We could add long COVID to this mix. You can see that POTS is one of the very common ones. And one of the ones that you probably see quite often as well are the pelvic pain syndromes. So you may or may not have noticed that your patients with pelvic pain syndrome are more likely to have fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, migraines, POTS. So the difference between central sensitivity syndromes and central sensitization is central sensitization is a process. It's a process that's commonly seen in all of these conditions, which is why the family name or the umbrella term is central sensitivity syndromes. But central sensitization occurs in other conditions that don't belong to this group. So for instance, any patient with chronic pain could be rheumatoid arthritis, could be osteoarthritis, has a component of central sensitization. And that's why more recently, a lot of the medications that we used to use in fibromyalgia are being used in patients with osteoarthritis because we now know that there's a central component to their pain. So here's a list of the possible conditions that can be seen with POTS. ME stands for myalgic encephalomyelitis, which is the long name for chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, myofascial pain, tension, headaches, migraines, irritable bowel syndrome, interstitial cystitis, pelvic pain syndromes, post-traumatic stress disorder, non-cardiac chest pain, another one that we're seeing very commonly in patients with long COVID, temporomandibular disorder, irritable larynx syndrome, central abdominal pain syndrome, which used to be called functional abdominal pain syndrome, which gives you a sense of the experience of these patients in terms of having their conditions described or diagnosed as psychiatric in nature. So on average, in my practice, I see five to six central sensitivity syndromes. I've seen over 7,500 patients with chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia, and very rarely have I seen those in isolation without at least one other central sensitivity syndrome. The maximum I've seen in one individual patient is 14. Like I said, the average is five or six. So part of the artificiality of syndromes is that it's basically a group of people who sit in a room and who say, hey, I see these symptoms commonly grouped together. Let's give it a name. And depending on who that group of people are, they will decide on a different group of symptoms based on their interest and their expertise. And so what's interesting is that these diagnoses are like nested dolls or, 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 and often overlap. So like I said, I'm not sure if the symptoms of fatigue, cognitive symptoms, sleep disturbance are related to POT specifically or the fact that these conditions often coexist. So here's an example. And so this is the diagnostic criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. 
And you can see that a diagnosis of postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome is a diagnostic criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. When I first saw that, I thought that was unusual, and the same for irritable bowel syndrome, because these are separate conditions. And so how can a separate condition be part of the diagnostic criteria for another condition? Here we have urinary frequency and bladder dysfunction. Well, this is just a mild form of interstitial cystitis. If it's severe enough, we can give it a separate name. And over here in the bottom, you see new sensitivities to food, medications, and or chemicals. And this is environmental sensitivities if it's more severe. We also have the possibility of widespread pain. And widespread pain with neurologic symptoms, sleep disturbance, and fatigue is fibromyalgia. So it's not surprising that patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, 70% of them will also have fibromyalgia, 40% of them will also have irritable bowel syndrome, 25% of them will also have migraines, about 20% of them will also have POTS. And so these conditions, I'm not sure if they actually are all separate, depending on if you're a lumper or a splitter in your approach clinically. But just to say the, the reason that it's important to give people the separate names is that often these conditions have different treatments, so different levers that we can pull to improve symptoms. So most patients with these conditions will have a precipitant. So we don't know the cause, but we see common precipitants. And the precipitants is usually overwhelming stress on the body. That overwhelming stress can be physical, can be psychological, or infectious. In a study, a recent study on cardiology, they looked at patients and they found that 41% of patients with POTS had viral as their identified precipitant. Surgery, 12%. And so one of the common things that I see, and often the surgeons don't see it because it's distant from the surgery itself, and it's not something that they're going to go back to the surgeon and complain about. But I commonly see surgery as a precipitant for these conditions. And the other thing that I saw quite a bit of was pregnancy and delivery. And not until I read this paper recently that I found out that about 9% of patients identify pregnancy itself as the precipitant for their POTS. So let's come back to the viral precipitant because that by far is the most common for all of these central sensitivity syndromes. This study is called the Dubo study. And basically it's a group of infectious disease doctors in a clinic in Australia and what they did is they prospectively followed patients with acute infections in their clinic. What they found was that 11% of the patients fulfilled criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome at six months. And this was consistent across infections. And so it was hypothesized that this likely represents a host response rather than the specific pathogen. And this is, I show you one study, but this is consistent in the literature. And that's why many of my colleagues and myself in the first month of the pandemic knew that we would see about 10% of patients who would go on to develop a post-viral syndrome. We didn't know it was gonna be called long COVID because it really doesn't need a new name. It's a post-viral syndrome. And that's why we were also surprised when we would see in the news and in the literature as experts are stumped. What is this new syndrome? Well, it's not new. It's been around forever. Even so overnight, I became an expert in what became long COVID because it's simply a post-viral syndrome. And post-viral syndromes exist along a spectrum. There's mild version of a post-viral syndrome. Many of us know a young adult or a teenager who developed mono and then was out of commission for six months to a year. On the more severe spectrum of the post-viral syndrome, people will develop criteria and full-blown chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. So there's a lot of confusion out there, or seeming confusion, when you look at the literature and what you hear on the news. 
And part of that has to do with how long COVID is defined. Because even our province doesn't define long COVID the way that I would define it. So here's a paper out of Rochester at the Mayo Clinic. And so some of you may be familiar with the term PASC, post-acute sequelae of COVID, or what some people are calling post-COVID syndromes. And some people use this interchangeably with long COVID, which I think is a mistake because it's really an umbrella term and it includes people with tissue damage. So it includes the people who have lung scarring, myocarditis, loss of taste or smell, blood clots. The second group in that umbrella term are the people with no identifiable tissue damage. And these are the people with post-viral syndrome. And the Mayo Clinic also keeps puts these groups of patients in the subgroup of central sensitivity syndromes. And so the third group is patients who develop psychological or psychiatric symptoms like depression, anxiety, and PTSD. So the Mayo Clinic says that we should reserve the term long COVID for the people who get the post-viral syndrome. The problem with calling everything long COVID is that the, the physicians who work there focus on the patients with tissue damage because they're the ones that they know what to do with. The patients who present with pain, fatigue, sleep disturbance, brain fog, and unexplained symptoms with normal lab tests get ignored because there's nothing to suggest that there's, quote, anything wrong. So Jillian talked about the fact that a lot of patients are actually uh, gaslit by their physicians, that it takes a long time to get a diagnosis. In this cross-sectional survey, and this was actually a large part of these uh, patients were Canadian because Calgary is a center of excellence for POTS. So it took up to five years to get diagnosed 27% of patients needed to see more than 10 physicians before getting diagnosed. And I've seen one patient who saw 17 specialists in this province before getting diagnosed. And like many of my patients, they were initially told that this was psychiatric. So here you see that in this, in this cross-sectional survey, 83% of patients had their symptoms diagnosed as psychiatric because there's no identifiable tissue damage. And interestingly, 9% reported pregnancy as a precipitant. And this is the same study I quoted above. So we talked about orthostatic intolerance and we talked about the fact that your heart races and you get... I'm just going to mute somebody here. There we go. Uh, a lot of patients and physicians think that you need tilt table testing. And so here you see a tilt table. And basically what they do is they lie flat, they measure your heart rate and blood pressure, then they put you somewhere between 70 and 90% incline, and they monitor you for 20 minutes. And so in this case, what you see is that the blood pressure maybe a little bit of dip, but quickly compensates and the blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic remains normal. So that's one of the diagnostic criteria. This is not associated with hypotension, but as soon as they put the person down, you can see that the heart rate jumped here by over 40 beats per minute and stayed persistently high until the patient was put back in the supine position. So the problem with the tilt table test is that there's a lot of false negatives. And so that it's recommended that you get multiple readings, which is very impractical, especially since this is not widely available and patients often wait more than a year. There's also more false negatives if it's not done in the early morning, because we said before that the symptoms are worse in the morning. And so 
my cardiology colleagues, most of them, and myself reserve the tilt table test for special circumstances, not when we're trying to make a diagnosis of POTS, because POTS is relatively easy, but when we're trying to distinguish POTS from other possible diagnoses. So instead, what we use is something called the NASA lean test. And why NASA? Well, actually, astronauts also get POTS. And for them, it's because their body has not had gravity for a while. And right at the beginning, we said this is a disease of gravity. So if you live in space, there is no POTS. But you also decondition your autonomic nervous system. And so it takes a while for astronauts to actually be able to tolerate upright posture when they come back. And so how do you do this? Well, you can actually get patients to do it themselves. And here's, whenever you get the slide, there's a, a link to the resource and uh, a fillable test sheet. So first thing in the morning, before getting out of bed, patient measures their heart rate, time zero. And then they stand up against the wall and what you're looking for is a more than 30 beat increase within 10 minutes. And that's why you can tell patients to measure their heart rate at zero, one, three, five, and 10 minutes. And they can stop if they meet criteria or if the patient has a watch, they can just monitor continuously for 10 minutes. I usually recommend that they have a spotter there. You don't want them to faint. And I usually ask them to repeat the test on a second day and measure blood pressure on that day instead. And the reason for that is that we want to identify the subgroup of patients who have hyperadrenergic POTS with a rise in blood pressure because we want to avoid using salt in that subgroup. The other reason is that there are some patients who will have a drop in blood pressure. And those patients, if they have chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, the central sensitivity syndromes, usually have a condition called NMH, neurally mediated hypotension, which is a fancy way of saying low blood pressure brain-based. So here is the sheet that I give patients. There, it tells them how to interpret it. It tells them about neurally mediated hypotension. It tells them about hyperadrenergic POTS. And there's a bunch of resources they can access, including an online video, some slides, uh, some papers, a handout on how to use salt. In terms of the formal diagnosis, there are different definitions. I use the same definition as the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. And so the main differences that you'll see for different um, different criteria is duration. Over here, it says more than three months. Some of the criteria require you to have more than six months duration. And over here, it says more than 30 beats in adults, more than 40 beats in children and adolescents, and absence of orthostatic hypotension. Some groups also say if your heart rate goes up above 120, regardless of the starting point. But the Canadian Cardiovascular Society is just an increase in 30 beats, absence of hypotension, lasting for more than three months. And again, unfortunately, these are not evidence-based recommendations, but it says we do not recommend routinely performing tilt table testing. So orthostatic intolerance and sinus tachycardia are common in patients that we see. So you need to make sure that your patient doesn't have something else that's the cause for their symptoms. The, the most likely ones that we need to look for are dehydration or blood loss, anemia, adrenal insufficiency, et cetera, et cetera. So POTS is part of a family of conditions called central sensitivity syndromes. And for patients who are presenting as pregnant, probably the most important one is going to be migraines, given its implication during pregnancy. But there are a couple of other conditions that are commonly associated with POTS that don't fit under the umbrella term of central sensitivity syndrome. 
The first one is hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So 31% of patients with POTS will have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. A further 24% 20 will have generalized joint hypermobility without fulfilling diagnostic criteria for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And so we often refer to this as hypermobility spectrum disorder. So it means that over 50% of patients with POTS will have hypermobility, which has implications for pregnancy. 30 to 40%, so around a third, will also have mast cell activation syndrome. So you may recall that mast cells are the cells that produce histamine. And finally, 20% of patients with POTS will have autoimmune disorders. And so Hashimoto's thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, any phospholipid, Sjogren's, celiac, et cetera, et cetera. In the study that I quoted earlier, 90% of patients with POTS had at least one comorbidity. The triad or the trifecta of POTS, hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and mast cell activation syndrome is an even more common triad in this patient population. And you might say, well, why does it matter that we identify those three? It's because patients who have POTS and mast cell activation will have special problems. So here's hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos. These are patients that are flexi-bendy. And here is what's called the Biden score. So they can touch their thumb to their forearm. They can bend their fingers back 90 degrees. Their elbows bow backwards. Their knees bow backwards. And they can touch their hands on the floor. A Biden score of five or more is equal to hypermobility. Criteria include things like joint dislocation, loose skin, and, and other factors. Like I said, mast cell activation syndrome is mast cells that are bloated with histamine. And normally, normally histamine is released as part of an allergic reaction. When you have mast cell activation, you have your mast cells release histamine even in the absence of an allergic reaction. So heat, touch, stress will cause release of mast cells. Some of these patients, if you rub your finger against their skin, you can write and so it's called dermatographia. And one of the main triggers over here, you can see that this is your HPA axis, your hypothalamic pituitary axis, your stress response, which starts in the hypothalamus, and you end up releasing cortisol and the adrenalines. But that CRH, the hormone that starts the HPA axis, also triggers release of histamines and other mediators. So patients who have hyperadrenergic POTS represent a difficult population to take care of. And in my internal medicine career, I had seen a number of patients with what we call whoops, pseudophiochromocytoma. And what we meant by that was that these patients acted like pheochromocytoma. We were, we were convinced we were going to make a diagnosis. But when we did imaging and blood testing, that is completely normal. And so what happens here is that patients who have hyperadrenergic POTS, if they have a significant release of histamine that causes a vasodilation response, they can have an overactive reflex and sympathetic activation, which results in blood pressures as high as the 240 to over 140 range. And so these patients are often uh, seen in the emergency room with acute, acute hypertensive crisis, get referred to an internist or cardiologist, and then never get diagnosed and nobody can figure out what's going on. So a large number of these patients have a combination of hyperandrogenergic POTS and mast cell activation. Other manifestations associated with POTS include skin manifestations. 
So here you can see evanescent hyperemia. Looks like there's a sunburn. If you press on here, it goes white. Stop. Patients. Oops, I'm going to mute somebody here. There we go. Here you can see the blue toes, the white toes, so Raynaud's phenomenon. And here's libido reticularis. You also see acrocyanosis, which is darkening and cyanosis in the lower extremities and the hands. So let's look at POTS and pregnancy. Here's a sample of patients, 8,900 patients with POTS. Over 40% of them reported more than one pregnancy. The vast majority, 81%, had worse symptoms of their POTS at some point in their pregnancy. And what happens early on seems to be predictive of what happens later. So the patients who were worse in the first trimester were worse in the second and third trimester. The patients who were better in their first trimester were also likely to be better in later trimesters. Interesting, over here, 8.1% reported pregnancy as the trigger for the onset of their POTS. This is a separate study. The other study had over 4,000 patients. This study has over 9,000 patients. And you can see that the number is very similar to the number that was quoted above with pregnancy as the trigger for POTS. This is a review of the literature that was kind of, kindly provided to me by Jillian. And it looks at a review of the literature and recommendations for evaluation and treatment. Bottom line is that there are no practice guidelines. And that's because there's very little or a few evidence-based recommendations that can be made. And so that most of the care for these patients is based on anecdotal reports and the experience of clinicians. This group could identify 12 studies, including case reports and three reviews. So in terms of labor and delivery, they said that early anesthetic management to prevent pain was important because pain is a major trigger for autonomic instability and makes symptoms worse. Because of the risk of hypotension and the risk of tachycardia, they suggest IV saline prior to epidural catheter replacement. They said that natural birth without pain control should be avoided, that home births are not recommended. And this has less to do with the POTS itself, but the fact that patients with POTS usually have comorbid conditions, and it's those comorbid conditions that are going to cause the problems, not the POTS itself. It says vaginal delivery appears to be safe and is preferred. In terms of complication and adverse effects, the good news is that it's not increased for the mother or the infant. And if there are increased complications, it's due to the associated conditions. One study, however, did note that there was a higher risk of hyperemesis gravidarum, and the authors wondered if this was related to the higher rate of migraines and POTS rather than the POTS itself. And so POTS with migraines, so we said 40% of patients with POTS have migraines, and migraines are associated with an increased risk of hypertensive disorders, low birth weight, preeclampsia, and miscarriage. Patients with autoimmune disorders represents 20% 20 20 of our patients with POTS. These patients are at increased risk of miscarriage and stillbirth. And depending on which autoimmune disorder for instance, if you have lupus or any phospholipid syndrome, you may need antiplatelet or anticoagulants. If you are positive for anti-SSA or anti-SSB, you may need to monitor for fetal congenital heart block. So again, it's the comorbid conditions of POTS that are causing the problem. Here are patients with hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. We said that over 50% of them fit into the hypermobile spectrum. And because of the loose connective tissue, these patients have increased pelvic girdle pain. And some patients will even need mobility aids like a wheelchair. More likely to have pre-labor spontaneous rupture of membranes, hypotension, baby 
presents in an unusual position. They are at higher risk for major and minor hemorrhage and impaired wound healing. And then depending on how they hold their baby when they're breastfeeding, they're at risk of shoulder joint dislocation. So here's uh, an older study in pregnancy and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome in the Dutch population. And you can see that here again, pelvic pain and instability, postpartum hemorrhage, complicated perineal wounds, and floppy infant syndrome are all more common. So let's look at the treatment of POTS. And here you can see that the bottom line is that most recommendations are safe in pregnancy. Again, there are no robust large randomized controlled trials. The mainstay of treatment is salt, unless you have hyperadrenergic POTS. In fact, 90% of my patients don't require anything more than salt. There are lifestyle modifications, medications, and we only usually consider medication in patients who still have symptoms after trying salt or can't tolerate oral salt replacement. So when we suggest salt, we suggest quite a bit of salt. We suggest nine grams of salt. And you guys know that here it says 0.9% normal saline, which is nine grams in a liter. So when we have a patient take in nine grams of salt and four cups of water, we're essentially giving them a liter of normal saline every day. Studies have compared IV normal saline to oral salt replacement. And the interesting thing is that oral salt replacement was more effective than normal saline. In patients with pregnancy, we need to watch for hypertension and edema. There's a lot of conditions that are commonly associated with POTS that may require dietary intervention, like irritable bowel syndrome, mast cell activation, non-gluten celiac sensitivity, sorry, non-celiac gluten sensitivity, delayed gastric emptying. And so there are some things that we can do from a dietary perspective. We usually have patients avoid triggers, so especially getting up too quick, prolonged standing, prolonged recumbency, hot temperatures, so patients tend to do worse in the summer, heavy meals, especially if they have refined carbohydrates, alcohol, undue exertion or medications that drop blood pressure can all exacerbate the symptoms. Exercise conditioning can be very helpful. In fact, in some patients, it may help reverse a component of their POTS if there's a big part that is due to deconditioning. However, the caveat is that Patients with chronic fatigue syndrome, if they overdo it, develop post-exertional malaise. And in that subgroup, you can actually make the POTS worse. Best types of exercise are aerobic, swimming, and recumbent. And in terms of pregnancy, the recommendation is that supine exercise is in the third and second trimester, while lying flat are not recommended because they compress the inferior vena cava and the aorta. Waist-high compression stockings are also a good choice and safe in pregnancy. Physical countermaneuvers have often been recommended. And here's a study to show how you know, they're really not that effective. The only one that was partially effective was to crouch down. In terms of medications, there's a number of medications that we use. And most of them are safe or relatively safe in pregnancy, except for evabradine. Evabradine is a new medication used in congestive heart failure that selectively uh, affects the heart rate. And I think I'm going to stop here and leave time for questions. Rebecca. Hello. Thank you for your presentation. It's been really, really enlightening. I've noticed um, definitely an increase, uh, at least patients at least knowing their diagnosis and saying, I have pot 
not necessarily in pregnancy yet, but certainly in the gynecologic population. So that overlap with the central sensitization syndromes, um, I think we're starting to see a lot more. So this is like super helpful. Um, I wonder like our, our internal, our OB internal medicine specialists at women's, like, I don't know if you've had any sort of interactions with them or cases that you follow together because they seem to be our usual go-to internists and I don't know how much experience they have as you said there's very limited data so I'm just wondering if, if you've had any cases or interactions with that group yeah unfortunately no I haven't had any interactions with that group so I'm not sure uh their level of expertise with uh but you know the bottom line is really that the POTS is more of a marker for other things that you need to be aware of because the POTS itself doesn't seem to um, to, to pose any extra risk to the mother or the infant during pregnancy and delivery. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm just checking the chat box. Um, I don't see any questions here. I did post the Dropbox link for today's presentation up on the chat. So um, the slides are accessible there. Um, I believe we may have had a patient last week, not with POTS, but with the EDS. And so that was interesting to me because, I mean, we don't commonly see that on the antenatal. And with that patient in particular, uh, I believe she was, uh, she did not receive an epidural because anesthesia thought that the risk of epiderma, epidural hematoma in that patient was too high. So what they ended up doing was a labor PCA, which was the first uh, time that I've encountered this in my, you know, tenure as educator and years of working here. Um, and so I, what I thought was interesting is the high sort of like correlation or incidence of the EDS amongst uh, patients with POTS, pregnant patients with POTS. Um, and then when you mentioned that it would be wise for these patients to have adequate anesthesia and analgesia on board for their labors. So now I'm thinking, is there a bit of a, um, I don't know, a conflict there? <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is that the vast majority of patients who have hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome don't know that they have it. Because in this province, we only have one person who has expertise in this, and it's a family doctor, Dr. Lucia Ma. And so it's really hard to get care. I've come across a physiotherapist with expertise in this area. So I've started a group, a 15-week group, for joint protection and management of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but I don't pretend to be an expert in the area. I am just trying to facilitate care for them. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's any other questions. If not, then we can conclude the rounds. And I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Arsenault, for joining us today at our rounds. <laughs> um, interesting topic for sure. Um, it's a topic that I don't know anything about, but I feel like I know now a little bit more about. So, <laughs> yes, and thank you, Jill, for organizing as a facilitator today as part of our multidisciplinary rounds. So, that ends our first year as multidisciplinary rounds. Congratulations, everyone. Thanks for participating and coming. So we start back up in September with uh, nursing. All right. That's right. Thanks a lot, everyone. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Arsenault, once again. Very, very helpful. Lots of thank yous in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Lots of thank yous. <laughs> Great. Bye, everyone. Thank you.